as we get older, we definitely need to spend a little time warming up. And when I say warming up, it's, I, I, I like to say you warm up to hit balls. You don't hit balls to warm up because if you're out there and you're a little more advanced in age, which, which I definitely am. And, and a lot of your listeners probably are, you probably want to get your body ready to do something as explosive as, as hit golf balls. Golf Smarter, number 729. Hey, this week on episode number 45 of Golf Smarter Mulligans, we get tips, drills, and insights from a certified golf zone instructor and tour coach, Bob Montello, on the impact better putting will have on your game and your scores. Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com, where you get premium used golf balls at a fraction of the cost of new balls. Plus, free shipping. Use Golf Smarter at checkout for 10% off every order every time, but that offer expires on April 1, 2020, so take advantage of it today at twoguyswithgolfballs.com. It's a myth. You won't leave your best shots on the range when you warm up. Featuring Josh Zander. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Josh. Thanks, Fred. It's always great to be with you. It is great to have you back on the show. You are a wealth of information I love to, to dig into. I, I was playing recently with a guy who shows up for the first tee without warming up, He's a kind of a new golfer. He's still not sure how far he hits his clubs. And I'm like, why don't you warm up or do you practice? And he goes, no, nah, I don't want to leave it all on the range. Huh? <laughs> You're laughing. Well, <laughs> what do I say to that? I, I love that person who, who like doesn't want to waste the good shots on the range. Like, exactly. I don't want to waste the good shots. Limit. There's a limit to how many good shots he can hit. Exactly. Yeah. What do I say to someone like that? How do I respond to that? Uh, you know, it's every, you know, everybody's out there for their own reason. Everybody knows their own bodies. I mean, if it was an older person, they're probably not making a smart decision. If it's a 10 year old, like my son just turned, it's actually his birthday today. I mean, Oh, happy birthday. He can get up there and just rip driver right out of bed. So um, I don't recommend that to him, but um, as we get older, we definitely need to spend a little time warming up and when i say warming up it's I, I i like to say you warm up to hit balls you don't hit balls to warm up because if you're out there and you're a little more advanced in age which which i definitely am and, and a lot of your listeners probably are you probably want to get your body ready to do something as explosive as as hit golf balls so uh yeah I, it doesn't really take that much but get yourself where you can do get a little light sweat going um do some do some uh, some stretching. I recommend the stretching you do is dynamic, so you're not holding any stretching, any stretches. You can do that afterwards. Uh, but there's so many great exercise uh, people in the exercise business who who love golf and have great exercise. I recommend just going online, and there's a there's a plethora of information out there on that. Yeah, YouTube can be a wealth of information. It can also be a disaster. It can also just make your mind explode. Yes, it can, yes, it can. <laughs> especially with golf instruction. Yeah, we need we need to be able to, to sift through all that stuff and get the get the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's harder and harder to do these days. We don't even want to talk politics about that. Everything um, right <laughs> podcast is great stuff, so you know you're getting good stuff when you come here. Oh, thank you, Josh, because I have guys like you on <laughs> who can address it and discuss it. Yeah. So. Now, now, one of the things that I, I mentioned to him was, you know, what a lot of professionals do and a lot of low handicap golfers do is they go to the range after their round. Yeah. Why is that a good idea? Um, it's to, it's to work out what happened on the golf course. The golf course is not a great place to work on your swing. I highly, I highly, uh, um, recommend not doing that. Um, take some time afterwards. If you have the energy to go sort things out in the range, start to understand that you can get more technical or mechanical on the range. That's not a great plane uh, for your mind to be in. But uh, yeah, I was just uh, uh, at the AT&T a few weeks ago caddying for one of my students. And, you know, I'm just a, 
I'm such a golf fan. I just love watching all those guys practice. And it's really a full-time job for those guys. I mean, between the travel and the fitness and warming up before playing and then afterwards they're on the range working with their with their coaches or working by themselves. I mean, I was there and um, and I stayed till darkness. And who was the last person on the range? It was Jordan Spieth, no caddy, just his tour bag. He was balancing his camera on the on his tour bag, trying to get a, an angle to uh, see his swing, and and you know going back to the recording afterwards and seeing what he did and making an adjustment and trying again. And he, and and I kind of looked at him like he's just like the rest of us. He's just trying to get better. And uh, you know afterwards is a great time to to do that. And uh, that's that's just part of getting better. It's part of the process and part of the, it's actually. I mean, I think it's quite an enjoyable part of the process is is doing the the work after. Um. When a guy like Jordan Spieth, who had some major impact on his, when he first came in and then has been, I don't want to use the word struggling, but it's not been as easy for him to win as he thought it would be after his rookie season. Um, what is he watching? Is he shooting video in slow motion? Uh, and what do you think he's looking for by just running his camera and letting it go? Well, he, his camera was was down the line, so I'm sure he was looking at his swing playing, maybe his uh, his posture at dress, his posture through impact. I'm sure he's talking to Cameron, um, uh, his uh, his coach, um, about what they're what they're working on um, and making sure he's just doing it and just uh, trying to make the necessary adjustments so he can go out and play. I think this was after Friday. It was Friday night after the second round. Um, and uh, he was just trying to figure out something. He ended up having a pretty good weekend. I think he kind of backed into a top 10 that week. So that was actually a pretty good, that, that grinding paid off for him that week. <laughs> Did you spend any time watching him while he was uh, on the range then? Uh, yeah, yeah. And I watched him do his practice session. And uh, as I did, just kind of walked up and down. I actually uh, saw, maybe I shouldn't mention the name of the player, but the, the first player is a very powerful striker of the golf ball who, is number, who has been number one in the world. And the first shot I saw him hit was a shank. So that should be <laughs> something that... Maybe he needs to uh, shave his beard. Oh, I don't know. I'm just I'm guessing. Not sure who who it was. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but he was tall. He he kind of bows his wrist at the top, and he shanked it. So, um, and I was just like, you know what? And, and then the next, very next one was pure, and and they just started ripping it. And so, hey, it happens to all of us. Um, and Good to know. Everybody, everybody hits bad shots, and you know, part of being a great player is being emotional, emotionally resilient enough to bounce back and and uh, not let stuff like that bother you, and and then and move on and hit a good one. The next time. So easy to say, just don't let that bother you. Yeah. But not it's so skill. easy. It's a skill. It's a it's skill. A skill. Like chipping is a skill. Like hitting a bunker shot's a skill. Right. It's a skill that a lot of people don't practice. Practice letting things go. Just literally get good at that. You'll have more fun on the golf course and you will perform better because you won't be in a bad state for your next shot. I find it easy to let things go early in the round. But when I start seeing... Uh, issues that I'm having early in the round continue through the round, I can sometimes get a little wacky. Yeah. And I try so hard to calm myself down, to breathe, to close my eyes, to to get back past it going, just go to your swing. Don't worry about that. But boy, it definitely can affect your mood. Yeah. And, and that's where the, the time in between shots is so important. The skill of what you do in between shots is, is key. So I got this from, uh, um, from PN Lin from Vision 54 is I have my students mm. have a little note card, just write down five things to make them happy. And that's what you think about between shots. And, you know, when I do, I, I especially do it with juniors and, you know, everybody has ice cream on their list. So they think of their favorite flavor of ice cream after they hit a bad shot and life's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> maybe something different for you. Maybe, uh, maybe a different sorbet. Different. Sorbet. I'll put it high on the list. A different treat. It's something that that gets you in a good mood because we play we play golf better when we're in good moods. So that's just a human thing. Wow. Uh, had both Lynn and uh, Pia on the show recently. They're they're remarkable. They are. They're great instructors. They have done such a great job in taking the science and making it digestible for the everyday golfer and the touring pros that they work with. They've just done a really good job organizing the material, communicating it, and giving people tools and skills for how to practice those, those uh, essential skills that they talked about, those human skills. 
So I'm curious if uh, while you were walking up and down the range uh, down at Pebble and Jordan turned around and said, hey, buddy, come here. What are you seeing? What would you tell him? Um, well, I'd be, on- to me? I'd be I'd be honest with him. Um, you know, I last year, um, Tony Romo and I spent a bunch of time together on the range and he, you know, he recognized me from uh, um, an organization that we're both familiar with, the Jim Hardy organization, The Plain Truth. And he's like, hey, you want to take a look? I'm struggling. And and uh, we kind of speak the same language because we both are familiar with the terminology that that uh, Jim Hardy uses and what he's trying, what Tony's trying to do with his swing. So, I mean, the, the first thing I would do is is uh, is ask Jordan, you know, what are you working on? Um, what do you what are you trying to do? Um, and then I just give him an honest uh, assessment of what of what I see. I mean, the, the golf ball goes a certain direction because of certain things. It knows where the face is pointing. It knows how fast that club face is pointing. It knows where on the club face that ball was hit. And it knows the direction that club was being swung. So that doesn't matter if it's Josh Zander, Fred Green, Jordan Spieth, or Joe Blow on the range. That golf ball is an inanimate object, and it is going to react to what's happening between the face, the path, where on the club face you're hitting, and how fast it's going. And the loft, and there's a whole bunch of things. I mean, we could get it, we could go down that road, but um, the bottom line is the ball is doing something because of what the club is doing, and what is the golfer doing to make the club do that? So that's the conversation I have with with Jordan or whoever, or then my next lesson um, who comes to who comes to the range at Stanford to take a lesson from me. It's like, okay, the ball is doing this because of X, Y, or Z, and I like. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jeff Ritter. I don't know if you've had him him on the on the podcast, but fifteen Jeff, times, fifteen times. So, so <laughs> at Jeff, least, I love Jeff. <laughs> when I first went to go work for Golf Digest, he was my first hire. He he, he became like my right hand guy. This was back in the late nineties, and we we're really good friends. And I love what he says. He 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 looks at the student. And he says, "You know, you're making a perfect swing for the golf for the ball flight you just hit. That's exactly perfect. Mm. Now, if you don't like the ball flight, we need to change something in this way." Right. And it's, it's as simple as that. And anything you do to that person, um, and I think we've talked about this on this podcast before, anything I tell somebody needs to relate to either a more solid contact, a better ball flight. And th- those are kind of the two things. And if it's not that, I'm not really going to go there because I'm not in there. It's not a beauty contest as far as who's got the prettiest golf swinger that Adam Scott would win every year and he'd be the number one player in the world. It's what's the ball doing? So, hey, Jordan, if your ball is fading, your ball is drawing, or it's, it's, it's going too low or too high, there's certain things. It's, it's not rocket science. It's right, it's right there in front of you. And, and now how to communicate that adjustment to Jordan, that's the art of teaching. We've gotten to the point where the diagnosis with all the tools we have and the knowledge we have now, if you're, if you're not diagnosing well, you probably shouldn't be in the business because there's, there's a lot of great teachers now with a lot of knowledge you can really diagnose well. And then what separates one teacher from another or what, what makes one student click with one teacher over another is really how they communicate. With somebody like a, like a better player, like a Jordan Spieth, who's able to hit all the golf shots, a lot of times you can fix their, their swings by having them hit different shots. So let's say, for example, it doesn't have to be Jordan. Let's just say somebody's hitting, uh, like somebody came in the other day and, and they were hitting pushes, hooks, and thin shots. Well, they could be calling me from Australia, telling me they're hitting pushes, hooks, and thin shots, and I know that their swing's coming too much from the inside. It's bottoming out early and catching the ball in the upswing. If the face is square to the path, it's going to be a push. If it's close to the path, it's going to be a hook. And if it's a more advanced player, I can say, hit a couple fades for me, and they might be fixed with that thought because that's going to get them to swing a little more left through the golf ball and keep the club face a little quieter and not roll it over as much. It's also going to move the bottom of the swing arc more forward so they can start compressing the golf ball. Something as simple as that, you know, it, 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 there's a mystery out there that like that the guys who teach tour players are amazing teachers because they're working with these great players. OK, I know these guys. I'm part of the top 100 and top 100 golf instructors. And those guys are my peers. They're my friends. And they teach a lot of tour players. You know what? It's a lot easier to teach a tour player because the minute you tell them what to do, they do it on the next swing. <laughs> That's how good. The athletes are. They're really, really good. So I'm not saying they're not great teachers. They are great teachers, which has gotten them to where they are. But but I've taught some of those players. I've been around them and it's like, you know what? It's God, it's easy. 
because you tell them and it's done. And then the yeah. person who's not the good athlete, who, who doesn't have much hand-eye coordination, who, who doesn't have flexibility, who doesn't have all that stuff, all that nice clay you want to have the mold as a teacher, that's the challenging student. That's what makes, and it's, you know what, it's equally or more gratifying to see somebody like that get the ball up in the air and somewhat straight than it is for a tour player to, you know, get rid of their hook and start hitting it straight again. Because that usually takes about five seconds. Wow. Amazing. Hey, let's take a quick time out. Um, sure. You dropped a bomb a little bit earlier that we need to talk about, and we'll be right back. Uh, you caddied at the AT&T? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you just kind of like oh by the way you buried the lead what was it what's up with that what happened uh well this is the second year i've done it one of my students who plays as an amateur in the in the at t um he's like well let's this will be like a, a three or four day playing lesson let's go down there and hang out together and you can see me in action and you know one of the challenges is, as a uh, as a teacher is you know, you, you work on the range, but you don't always get to see your players on the golf course, right, in the mm -hmm. setting. So I try to do as many playing lessons as possible, but it's it's challenging to get everybody to commit that much time. So here's a chance for um, my student and I to spend a lot of time together for me to see him under the gun um, and see him in different conditions. And, you know, for the amateurs out there, they're, they're outside their comfort zone. They really are. I mean, they're trying to stay out of the pro's way. They don't want to, they, they don't want to hit a bad shot. They, they honestly, sometimes, you know, they don't want to hurt somebody in the gallery by hitting a bad shot because there's a lot of people out there, right? So it's a yeah. stressful place and seeing how people handle it. And then it really shows where the weaknesses are, which makes my, my job easier when it comes back to getting on a lesson team and saying, okay, here are the skills that you need to improve at. And we actually do a, an assessment afterwards. Last year, um, I did an assessment and I actually graded each part of his game. That was maybe a mistake to put a, a B minus or a B plus where he thought he might've done better. But so this year I just did the assessment. And I left the grades off. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did it mess with his, 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 ah, ear, his no, mind? So, so, so the bottom line is all I really need to communicate to him is like, okay, this part of your game needs work. This was a strength. This was a strength. This was a weakness. Here are certain situations that you could have done better. Um, and, uh, and, and so I just left the, I left the grades off. It's kind of like the, uh, the, uh, when you go to college and you can take a, a pass fail class instead of get a, <laughs> get a grade. There's less speaking, of speaking from someone who go, works at Stanford. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, so this is an amateur. You can't, you're not going to share this person's. No, I don't think that's not necessary, but it's, no, it's, not. it's, it's a highlight. It's one of the highlights of the year for me because uh, it, you know, I, even though I'm not the player and, and I've been that player playing in those tournaments, but it's just really fun to be back in the arena and mm. it's fun to watch, you know, the best players on the planet hit the golf ball because they're just so amazing. They work so hard, but they are so good. And it's just fun to, uh, to see what the best players are doing because they're always trying to get better. They're just like the rest of us. They just have a higher skill set, but they're, they're just like the rest of us. They're all trying to get it's like Tiger says, I'm just trying to get better today than I was yesterday. And just keep right. improving. Right. Well, that's interesting is, is that I opened the conversation with someone who doesn't warm up, doesn't practice, doesn't want to leave it on the range. And here you talk about the best players in the world saying they work so hard at it. They do. Their competition is so, so strong out there. And it's not like the PGA Tour is the only place you can make a living, you know, but it's a, it's a grind. It's a grind. And if you're, if you're not putting in the work, there's somebody equally as talented who will, who will pass you. And you don't hear about a lot of those guys, you know, you don't, right. it's when Tiger has a slump, everybody hears about it. When somebody else has a slump and all of a sudden you don't see their name. It's like, what happened to that guy? Yeah. Well, what happened to that guy? And then all of a sudden he comes back and he does something. It's like, where's that guy been? You know, where's Nick Watney <laughs> been for the last four years? Oh, he was in here. Oh, okay. He was like a tough, five or six player in the world at one point, you know, it's like these guys, it's, it's tough. It's tough. So you gotta, I mean, you probably have, I don't know, a, you have a bigger window than a lot of other, a lot of other professions. Um, but still there's, everybody wants your job. It's tough yeah. to be one of those 125 that keeps their job on the, on the PGA tour. Yeah. And what separates number one from number 10 to number 100 is infinitesimal really. 
Yeah. I mean, because on any given day, number 100 is going to win. And sure. that's part of what's so amazing about golf is that the parity in golf yeah. um, is constant. Yeah. There, there, there's good, there's access to good instruction everywhere. Golf is growing around the world. You know, Asia, huge boom of golf. You know, European players continue to, uh, to you know, Europe continues to put out great players. The United States has great college golf programs. I mean, it's it, the, the, the junior golf circuit is literally like a tour. You got these little touring pros. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a very, very small piece of the pie that gets to play at that high level. So yeah. they're not, they're, they're not, they're holding on to those cards tight because they, they, they know that there's somebody else who wants that, that card. That's absolutely for sure. It's incredible. And to have somebody that can come along and be a once in a generation type player that can dominate the sport for more than one season, um, is really a remarkable feat. I've had, I've had multiple teachers on the show who talked about playing professionally on one level of a tour or another and commented that they're not a grinder. Mm-hmm. They, you know, that they don't like the grind and they don't feel like that they're competent in being a grinder. Yeah. What, how do you interpret that? I always find that fascinating. That, like they're that good, but there's something that holds them back. Yeah, I think there's enough. If you take like a pool of players that all have talent and then you have like the Jerry Rice who has the talent, but he's also a really hard worker. Those are the guys mm-hmm. who stick around, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, I mean, uh, Cameron Champ was in our group for the three days. It was fun to watch him hit a golf ball. I mean, that guy's got more talent in his little finger. And then Greg Chalmers was the other pro in our group, and and he's 46 years old. He's towards the tail end of his PGA Tour career. I'm sure he'll do well in the Champions Tour. But it was really interesting after about – talk about a grinder. He was working hard on every shot. He's 50 yards behind Cameron on every drive. Now Cameron hits at 340, 350. So Greg is adequately out there about 295 to 305 every drive, splitting the fairways. And just grinding on every shot, very meticulous, very much of a professional. And by the way, a super person, a super nice guy. But, but uh, I mean, that's that's the kind of player who can last out there. Obviously, he's now 46 and has had a long, you know, playing career. Not necessarily on the PGA Tour, but there's other places to play as well. Um, but some people are just willing to put in the work, and there's very few who can just these days just survive on their on their talent alone. It's just. There's too many. There's too many good players out there now. The, the, the instruction's too good. The the instruction's very good. The the access to information's there. Um, so it's not like oh, you just happen to you know have had a good coach. There's good coaches everywhere now. Um, you don't know what a good swing is. Oh yeah, they can look at how you do is look on the internet. And you can start copying really good swings if you're a, if you're a junior. So that there, there's a bigger pool out there, and so I think the ones who are the harder workers. Are they going to be the ones who the ones who make it? Now, not everybody has that kind of like you say grinder mentality. Um, you need to know when you're you know when you're done too. Um, as far as like not burning yourself out and having a balance to your life as well, because you can easily kind of overdo it and burn out. So that's all part of the maturity process. Um, I'm I'm kind of afraid of some of the young kids who are just going out and just playing so much golf and having like repetitive use injuries and things like that. Um, and getting burnt out a little bit early. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a concern. I talked to my, uh, my parents of juniors that just to just make sure they pace themselves because what we're really trying to do, I like what the, T, the Titleist Performance Institute philosophy is, let's build a really good 18-year-old golfer. Let's not make it the best 12-year-old golfer. In other words, mm. 12-year-olds are playing basketball and they're playing soccer and they're doing other things to develop their functional movement skills and not just doing all golf. And then once they get to be 14 or 15, they can specialize in golf or whatever other sport they decide to do at that point, but they'll have all the movement skills. And then you get to a, if, if I get a player like that, if I get a junior who's 15, who, who loves golf, plays basketball, plays soccer, football, whatever. Um, now I've got an athlete and I can mold that athlete, that explosive athlete to have a great swing. That's going to be the player who can really, who can really succeed. So I'm going off on a little tangent here, but that's kind of like, well. Welcome to Golf Smarter. Yeah. So, <laughs> it, it's very, very rarely a straight line, kind of like my golf game. But <laughs> let's take another short time out. We'll be right back.
access to information. You've mentioned it a couple times now. Uh, access is one thing. Implementation is a whole different thing. You can learn from somebody. You can walk away with a great tip. But without a teacher, without somebody to, to look at you, not just watching your own video, you know, not yourself watching your video going, okay, I learned this on, on YouTube and now I've taken some video of myself. It's, it's assessing it and correcting it. Yeah. That's not as easy as just watching stuff going, I learned this this week. Right. Right. I mean, you definitely, there's, there's the whole process of, of um, um, habituating a, a motor skill. That's like, that's a, a separate conversation of how you like actually integrate something. And hopefully you're integrating something that's relevant to what you need to do. Um, but I see myself as somebody who can help a player sort through the massive amount of information out there and say, okay, this is what's applicable, applicable to you, right? Yeah, just because Rory's doing this, this is actually fit you. Um, if you if you talk to uh, teachers like Mike Adams um, out there who do the bioswing dynamics, EA Tischler's another one, who they measure your body to make sure what you're doing is actually appropriate biomechanically for what you can do. Um, so what might be a correct grip for one person may not be a correct grip for somebody else. I like the grip of like Jack Nicholas. Yeah, but you know, Jack Nicholas, um, his body's different than yours. And so the way he moves a club is different than yours. You're not going to have the flying right elbow. If you gave Jason Duffner uh, Nicholas's flying right elbow, Jason Duffner wouldn't be on the tour anymore because that's not how his body works, right? So you got to figure out, hey, what works for you? And there's so many ways to do it that there's no, there's no one way. There's, there's your way. I like that old Arnold Palmer ad where he says, it's your swing. You know, it's my swing. It's your swing. It's like, it's not, it's, I don't need to have Adam Scott swing. I keep using Adam Scott because he's got this pretty swing and it fits him beautifully, but that's not necessarily the way, it's not the way Sergio hits. It's not the way Furyk hits. It's not the way Tiger hits it. And by the way, Adam learned by watching Tiger, but basically made it his own. So mm -hmm. you've got, you've got, you've got to basically have some sort of sounding board coach type person who can help you navigate all that information. It's very rare the person these days who can just look at something, A, implement it and actually do what, what the teacher's asking them to do or what the information is asking for. That's, that's another, that's another road we can go down. Um, but you need to make sure that it's, that it's right for you. If not, you can spend a lot of time working on something that's just not going to help you. And boy, is that a bummer. For the amateur player, do you think it's more advantageous to spend 60 or 90 minutes on the range with a teacher or a playing lesson? With the goal Josh is still here, by the way. He's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's like, like when you, if you come and take a lesson from me, you might hear some silence as I'm just kind of noodling through the whole thing and trying to come out with the most simple answer. That's kind of how I work. I'm not a talk after every swing kind of a coach. i let you uh -huh. kind of um, do some stuff for a while while I think about what, where we need to go next. Um, so that's an interesting question and I'm going to answer it with, um, and uh, again, I'll use Mike Adams again. He says the answer to every golf question is it depends, right? It really depends on the student. What does that student need? Right? So is that student losing a lot of shots because they're making poor decisions on the golf course? They're, they're picking bad lines. They're being aggressive when they shouldn't be. They don't understand the percentages of, of how to play the game they don't understand shot selection, then yeah, we, I can help the person a ton on the golf course. But if that person is really struggling, just getting a consistent ball flight, we're probably wasting our time being out there on the golf course. Cause they're just going to be hitting shot at bad shot after bad shot. And they're going to ask me what they're doing with their swing. We might as well just go back to the range. So I think, I think I, I'm going to, I'm just going to go with it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the person, of course. Person. And then just, uh, for practice purposes, yeah. pounding balls or going out and playing and not keeping score because the score, the scorecard can really mess with you. Yeah. Well, I think I've talked to you about this on the podcast. If I could, if I could change amateur golf, not competitive amateur golf, but just weekend amateur fun golf, it would be, if there's one thing that changes, there's no score. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when you go over and play at Muirfield if you ever get a chance to go play Muirfield over in Scotland, you get to play your ball in the morning and the afternoon, and then you go have lunch, you put your coat and tie and you go and have lunch. They're nice. They're nice uh, clubhouse there. And then in the afternoon you go play uh, foursomes, which is alternate shot. And it's great. You play the, 
you I tee off and you hit the next one, we play it out, and you walk to the second tee, tee off, I'm already walking to the middle of the fairway where I'm going to hit the next shot from because I assume that's where you're going to hit the next shot. But that's where you're going to hit your drive, friend. So, And we just go out and we play in about two hours, and we have a great time and have a beer afterwards, and that is a great, fun day. And that's how a lot of golf is played over there. So literally, people go out there with their friends and have a great time, and they get to whack a ball around every you know, every few minutes. And it's a, it's a, it's a really nice, nice experience versus what golf has become for a lot of people, which is misery. They're out there worrying about their score. And, you know, you can talk to P and Len about this. So you're blue in the face. If you go out there and you worry about, you have expectations or you're worrying about the results, you're not in the present. And if you're not in the present, you're not in the performance state. <laughs> so, um, be a kid out there, have fun with a shot in front of you, get creative, get weird, have fun, be, a, you know, use your imagination, picture things, listen for things, feel things and have a great time out there. And, and you'll stay in the present. You'll be a much better golfer for sure. Oh, such fabulous advice. Thank you. I need, I need to take a little left turn here just for the last question. Cause I'm fascinated your thoughts on the new rules for 2020. Hmm. I think, I think a lot of people are still confused about them. I tell you what, if I could change one thing, it's how you drop the ball. It's the most awkward position to drop a ball from. <laughs> from, your, on, from your knees? From your knee, well, you know, knee height. So people like get in this awkward squat and try to, try to drop the ball from their knee. Um, I, I, I love the fact that you can now touch your line. You can pat down a spike mark. I never thought it was fair if there was a spike mark in your way that you have to putt over it. That's, or a divot, you know. And I don't think it's really slowing down the pace. I don't think people are like taking 30 footers and tapping on every spike mark in the way. I haven't seen that, at least when I played. Um, leaving the flag stick in helps the pace of play. So I think, I think a, lot of them are, a lot of them are really good. Um, and I think they can still evolve even further. Now, anything that's just make the, fit, the game more fun, um, easier, uh, is, is a good thing. You think making the game easier is a good thing for the game? Because yeah. it seems like the USGA has always been kind of like, I, as I've said in the past, that they're an advocate for the golf course, not the golfer. Mm -hmm. um, and that they want it to be difficult and elite. Yeah, I, I, I'm not so sure that's going to be where the future of the USGA goes. That may have been the past. I think mm -hmm. the USGA leadership um, will listen to the everyday golfer. And realize that they want to keep growing the game that making it harder and making the rules so you know uh, i don't know what the, what the word for it is but just difficult to understand and, and like people worried about whether they're doing the right things um it, I, I i think if they want to keep growing the game they'll they'll uh they'll look to make things easier faster i think that's where we have to go i mean we're definitely living in an age of people with very little patience very little time uh, attention spans are shorter um it's, it's, uh, I mean, I don't think of any, I mean, I may be a golf instructor, but playing golf is my hobby now. And I can't think of a better way to spend four or five hours and be out there with my friends on the golf course, whacking the ball around and just chatting about life or telling jokes. It's just a great time away from videos and phones and computers and all that. And you get very little of that these days. Um, yep. so I want that time to be super fun and, and uh, if they can make the rules just a little bit easier and the game a little faster, um, I think that that's a, that's a good thing. Someone recently was uh, questioning my choice of hitting from the white tees. And I'm like, I still haven't shot par from the white tees. Why do I need to make it harder than it is? I'll tell you what, it's actually, I think it's fun to go play different tees because you kind of get to yeah. play a different golf course. And exactly. My coach in college, one of the things he made us do is he, he'd say, hey, we're going to play the Back then, you know, I'm dating myself. Back then, they were called the ladies' tees, but now they're called the forward tees. So let's go play the forward tees and see, see, you know, get used to shooting something in the '60s because that's what I need you guys to shoot. I need you guys to shoot short scores in the '60s so we can start winning some college golf tournaments. So just getting into the 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 framework of like or the point of view that hey, I can really score. And yeah, so then I go 30 yards back, but I still have that feeling. Yeah, I buried the hole last time, and just like that that mentality of of, uh, of being able to really attack a golf course and. And, uh, yeah, so I think, I think people should change tees. I don't, you know, I hit the ball about 290 to 300 yards on a good one. I don't go back and play the tips everywhere I go. It's like, why do I want to hit five irons and six irons? I'd rather hit eight irons and nine irons and 
and make some birdies and gets yep. you know, two on par fives. It's more fun for me. Yep. Um, and then, you know, so if, if somebody, if a tour player hits it 30, 40, 50 yards by me, then let them go back there. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite forward tees on the planet that I've ever seen yep. are at Stanford University Golf Course because okay. they're blue. Yeah. But, right. And that's, um, that's just a slap at Cal. Well, that was just, <laughs> the rivalry. That was right? the best thing that I remember that when I was, when I, when I was a freshman at Stanford and I get to the first hole for our first qualifier, I'm like, why are the back tees, the ladies tees? That's so bizarre. Why are they red? This was nice. <laughs> it, was, it was red. It was hey, red as ladies tees. It, everywhere I played growing up, the red were ladies. They were forward. It's like, Oh, it's the Stanford Cardinal. Yeah, now I get yep, it. Yep, absolutely. All right, so uh, your URL, your website is xandergolf.com. Xandergolf.com, that's where you can book lessons and stay tuned for later on this summer, the Xander Golf app. Ooh, well, get you back on when that launches so we can promote it for you. Yeah, we can do online lessons. There'll be videos, instructional videos. There'll be a place for people to chat with each other, give me some ideas on what future things people want to hear about. So. That is coming. I'm very excited about it. Very exciting news. The Xander Golf app, huh? Perfect. I'm going to make a note on that so we can bring you back when it releases. Perfect. Hey, bud. It's great to talk to you again. Thank you for always having a wealth of information and an opinion. <laughs> well, I've been teaching now for 25 years and playing for 43, so hopefully there's a lot in there. I'm happy to share more whenever you want to talk to me. So as we head into the official start of the golf season, for a lot of places in the United States, you know, out here in California, the southern parts, playing 12 months a year. But it sure seems by the audience participation and downloads that we get on this show that golf really goes from <laughs> March, uh, April, eh, you know, from the Masters on through end of October. But as we get started in the official golf season, and we're always here to try to help you become better. I want to let you know that our next four episodes, all in, Mar all in March, all in March, our next four episodes, all in March, will be dedicated to our late friend, Tony Manzoni. Tony made a dozen appearances on Golf Smarter between October 2013 and December 2017 before he lost his battle to cancer at the age of 82. If you're not familiar with Tony, I highly advise that you don't miss the opportunity to hear from one of golf's all-time great unsung heroes of golf instruction. A little background, Tony was a tenured teacher at College of the Desert in Coachella Valley, where Palm Springs is located. He founded the school's golf management program in 1986. And more significantly, Tony was such a great teacher that he led the College of the Desert men's golf team to five state community college championships and 28 conference titles in 29 years. No question that Tony generated more emails of support, questions about his methods, and requests for his book and video than any other teacher that's been featured on the 15 years of this podcast. Get more details next week, but I just wanted to urge you not to miss these shows and to tell your golf buddies about these incredible free lessons that could make you a much, they will make you a much better golfer. Please follow at Golf Smarter on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Read about our weekly content on LinkedIn, or if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for me, just click on the Hey Fred button at GolfSmarter.com.